In her very first notes in planning the novel The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand wrote one of the very first things she wrote in thinking about the novel, thinking about the ideas she was going to express in it. One of the very first things she wrote was that the first purpose of the book was going to be a defense of egoism in its real meaning, a new definition of egoism and its living example. Well, the living example of Ayn Rand's new definition of egoism is Howard Rourke. He embodies what she had in mind in presenting a new definition of egoism. But the theme of the Fountainhead is broader than the issue of egoism versus altruism. The issue of egoism versus altruism in the field of ethics has to do with the question of what is the purpose of one's moral action? Should one act selfishly or should one act selflessly? And it's the question of what is the goal or the purpose of one's action? Should one act for the sake of one's own interests or for the sake of others? But the field of ethics addresses much broader questions than just the question of what the goal of one's action should be. Um, because just say, for example, you take an egoistic position that the, that the goal of one's action should be to act for the sake of one's own interests, that leaves open the question of how it is that one goes about acting in one's interest. What is in one's interest? What would it mean to act for the sake of others? What would it mean to act for one's own, for, for one's own sake? So in presenting a new code of ethics, a new moral philosophy, one has to address questions that are broader than simply the question of what should the goal or purpose of one's moral action be. And Ayn Rand does this in The Fountainhead. She described the theme of The Fountainhead as individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in man's soul. And her goal was not just to present Howard Rourke as an embodiment of, of a new kind of selfishness, but also to indicate more broadly what that selfishness consists of and how one goes about achieving it, how one acts in one's own interests. So she's presenting a new morality of individualism uh, indi what she means by individualism in man's soul is individualism as a moral philosophy, which includes the concept of egoism, but it also includes ideas about what it means to act as an individualist. Now, in the character of Howard Rourke, there are sort of two traits or qualities, two principles that really define the essence of how he's being portrayed as acting for the sake of his own interest and how he's acting as an individualist. And the two most important traits that define the character of Howard Rourke are his independence and his integrity. So as part of the answer of how one goes about acting egoistically, how one goes about acting in a properly selfish manner, part of Ayn Rand's answer, as embodied in the character of Howard Rourke, is that one does it by being an independent person. And that includes having the integrity to stick to one's own independent judgment. Now, in talking about the themes of the Fountainhead, we've already spent a lot of time talking about how Ayn Rand overturns our conventional notions of selfishness and selflessness, and how we see in the characters of, for example, Keating and Wynan, they embody our conventional notion of selfishness, but what she shows through those characters is in what way they're actually not acting in a properly selfish manner. Now, looking at it more broadly from this broader perspective, what we see is that, in fact, instead of embodying the virtue of independence, these characters have made themselves dependent on others. And because they place their focus on the rest of humanity as a, as a group, they, in fact, are not embodiments of individualism, but of collectivism in this moral sense. So what we're going to talk about in this section is we're going to focus on Howard Rourke and we're going to look at these broader aspects of his character. We'll start by looking at this issue of selfishness versus selflessness once again. He, Rourke is somebody who comes across as initially as seeming to embody a, a conventional kind of selflessness, the way he sort of selflessly sacrifices for the sake of his art. So we're going to talk about how he appears to be acting in a selfless way and in what way he actually acts in a selfish way in the, this new concept of egoism that Ayn Rand is defining. And then we're going to look more broadly at his character and look at other aspects of his character and talk about in what way he represents a whole moral philosophy of individualism in man's soul. 
And at the very end, we'll turn once again to looking at collectivism in a man's soul. Now, when we meet Howard Rourke at the start of the novel, he comes across in certain ways as an unselfish man. You know, he's supposed to be the paragon of selfishness in the story, but in the first part of the book, there's a certain respect in which he seems, you know, selfless or unselfish. And he's unselfish in the sense that he, he seems to be willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of preserving his artistic integrity. You know, he's expelled from architecture school. Why? Because he refuses to design buildings by copying the styles of the past. He has his own style of architecture and his own standards, and he wants to follow those own standards, and it ends up getting him expelled from architecture school. He gets fired from Guy Franken's office, his, for a job as a draftsman in Guy Franken's office, for the same reason. Guy Franken wants him to design a building using a classical motif, and Rourke refuses to do it and and he ends up getting fired he loses commission after commission because he refuses to give clients what they want if they want him to build an english tudor house or a southern plantation you know he doesn't build buildings in those styles he builds buildings in his own style and he's willing to lose clients for the sake of his artistic vision and his artistic standards and the climax of this in part one is the incident of the manhattan bank building so he's got a commission to design a building for the Manhattan Bank Company. And he presents his designs, and the company wants to hire him, but they want him to compromise on his design. They want him to add a classical facade and other elements to the design. And um, even though he's at the, basically at the end of his finances, he's going to have to close his office, um, nevertheless, because it, it would compromise uh, the integrity of the design, Rourke refuses the commission. And there's a certain sense in which all of this comes across as a sort of almost a martyrdom, a selfless devotion to the craft. You know, one of the people on the bank's board of directors even says to him, do you have to be so fanatical and selfless about it? And so when we see Rourke in the first part of the novel, in some ways he doesn't seem like the paragon of selfishness, he seems like somebody who's selflessly devoted to his art and who's willing to, you know, sacrifice everything, clients, income, everything for the sake of his artistic integrity. But at the same time, right from the very beginning, we see that, the, that in other ways, he is a fundamentally selfish person. We see his his fundamental uh, self-esteem and his independence. We see that he's someone who thinks for himself and knows what he wants in life. And he himself doesn't regard the actions that he takes, you know, the losing the clients, losing the job, losing the commission. He himself doesn't regard this as an act of, you know, sacrifice or martyrdom for the sake of a cause. When the man on the bank's board of directors says to him, do you have to be quite so fanatical and selfless about it? How does Howard Rourke answer? He says, that was the most selfish thing you've ever seen a man do. So Rourke sees the actions that he's taking as being fundamentally selfish, but clearly in a different way to the way we normally think about selfishness. So what is it that constitutes Rourke's fundamental selfishness? What makes Rourke seem unselfish by conventional standards is that he's not motivated primarily by things like money or fame or admiration, you know, things that we normally associated with someone who's sort of selfishly going after, you know, wealth and fame and fortune. What his selfishness consists of is what he is motivated by. And in a word, what Howard Rourke is motivated by is his work the work that he's chosen to do in his life and his love for that work. And he explains the contrast to Peter Keating, this, that he's not primarily after money and so on, but, but primarily motivated by his work. He explains this to Peter Keating when they're talking about the Cortland Homes project. Basically, they're agreeing that Keating, you know, Rourke will design in the buildings, Keating will 
take everything else, the fame, the money, etc. And Rourke is explaining his motivation to Keating, and he explains it as follows. I like to receive money for my work, but I can pass that up this time. I like to have people know my work is done by me, but I can pass that up. I like to have tenants made happy by my work, but that doesn't matter too much. The only thing that matters, my goal, my reward, my beginning, my end, is the work itself, my work done my way. What motivates Rourke and what drives every choice and every action that he takes from early childhood is his desire to be an architect. He decides at a very young age as a child that he wants to be an architect and he works his way through school. He takes jobs in all the building trades so that he can be around buildings and understand their construction and he works his way through the profession in order to become an architect. And what motivates him is the work itself, the work of designing buildings. What Rourke is passionate about, what brings him joy and brings him happiness, is the action of solving the intellectual problems involved with designing a building. He's motivated by the intellectual challenge of taking all of the elements of an architectural assignment, the site, the materials, the specifications, all the things that go into a building, and solving the intellectual problem of integrating all of those elements into a design for a building. Howard Rourke is passionate about, about designing beautiful buildings, about designing buildings whose form is integrated to their function, buildings that have integrity, buildings that have harmony. He has a creative vision and he wants to design buildings that express that original creative vision. This is what he's passionate about. This is what motivates him. And there's an exchange with his mentor, Henry Cameron, where, where he talks about this. You know, Cameron is sort of grilling him about, why, what are you after? This is when Rourke first comes to want to work for him. And Cameron, you know, is questioning him about this. And they have the following exchange. Rourke says, I love this earth. That's all I love. I don't like the shape of things on this earth. I want to change them. For whom, Cameron asks him. For myself, says Rourke. So this is the sense in which Rourke is fundamentally a selfish person. What constitutes selfishness in the spiritual sense is a way that Ayn Rand described this at one point. Selfishness in the true spiritual sense. What constitutes Rourke's selfishness is the fact that what he's motivated by is doing his work, doing productive work for the sake of his own happiness. That's what he's after, that's what he's about. And, you know, as he explains to Peter Keating, all the other things that come with it, money, fame, all that sort of thing, these are secondary consequences. These are effects that come as a result of, of the primary, and the primary has to be the work. And he explains this to Peter Keating. He says, you'll get everything society can give a man. You'll keep all the money. You'll take any fame or honor anyone might want to grant. You'll accept such gratitude as the tenants might feel. And I, I'll take what nobody can give a man except himself. I will have built Cortland. So Rourke is motivated primarily by his work. His work is what drives him and what motivates him. And he's fundamentally independent in every aspect of the way he goes about doing his work. Most of the other people in his profession are portrayed as, you know, basically just doing architecture by copying historical styles. For Howard Rourke, it's inconceivable to practice as an architect by designing classical buildings or Renaissance buildings or Gothic buildings by, by copying the designs of the past. For him, the work of architecture is the work, the creative work of coming up with a unique design, of being presented with a, an architectural commission with all the elements and figuring out a design that integrates all those elements into a building that serves the purpose of the building. That is the work of an architect. That's the work that he wants to do. You know, to copy, to, to do the work of architecture by just copying designs of the past um, would, would 
you know, completely vitiate what it is that he finds challenging and rewarding about the work. It would make it completely empty and meaningless for him. And in his view, you know, what others have done in the past is completely relevant. He, he as an architect, is interested in designing buildings. He doesn't, you know, so what, how other people have designed them in the past doesn't matter. It's not, it's completely irrelevant to him. And he explains, he explains this point in a conversation that he has with the dean at his school when he's, you know, being expelled from architecture school. No two materials are alike. No two sites on earth are alike. No two buildings have the same purpose. The purpose, the site, the material determine the shape. Nothing can be reasonable or beautiful unless it's made by one central idea. And the idea sets every detail. The Parthenon did not serve the same purpose as its wooden ancestor. An airline terminal does not serve the same purpose as the Parthenon. Every form has its own meaning. Every man creates his meaning and form and goal. Why is it so important what others have done? Why does it become sacred by the mere fact of not being your own? Why is anyone and everyone right so long as it's not yourself? It's also inconceivable to Rourke to practice architecture by just giving the clients what they want. So this is something else that everyone in his profession does. For the other architects in his profession, they are completely focused on the client. The client is everything. You know, their desires, their needs, the architect's role is simply to express the client's wishes. For Rourke, this is inconceivable to practice architecture in this way. And as he tells the dean, he doesn't intend to build in order to have clients. He intends to have clients in order to build. So again, for him, the work of architecture is the work of being the person who designs the building. If he were to just give the client whatever they want, he would be committing a fraud in his view. He wouldn't be doing the work of being an architect. Now, he recognizes that he does need clients. You know, as he tells Austin Heller, he says, I'm not building mausoleums, right? He's not building buildings for dead people. He needs clients in order to be able to practice his profession. But his view of clients is that basically he is trading with them, that he's trading value for value. And his view of the client's needs is that essentially they constitute part of the architectural assignment in the same way that the site, the materials, the specifications, the purpose of the building, the requirements of the clients are part of the design challenge. And once he takes those, so he has to think about them because it's part of the whole point of doing the building, but he treats them in the same way that he would treat you know, the granite or the wood that he's using. It's part of the challenge of, that he's trying to solve. And for him, the work is taking all of those elements and integrating them into a building. So this is not just giving the clients whatever they want. It's taking their needs as part of the challenge, but then being the creative artist who comes up with the design for the building and presenting it to the clients. That's his side of the trade. And for him not to do that, he would regard it basically as a fraud. That He's not doing his job if he were to just you know, give the clients whatever. If someone comes along and wants a Tudor house, well, he'll just copy, you know, Tudor houses from the past, and then he's done. He would regard that as a fraud. He's not doing the work that he has set out to do and that he's being hired for. Howard Rourke's essential defining characteristic is his fundamental independence. In his basic goals and motives in life, he's completely independent of other people. And he talks about the meaning of independence. At the end of the novel, in his courtroom speech, he talks about the spirit of the creator and how the essence of the creator is his fundamental independence. This is what he says. The creator lives for his work. He needs no other men. His primary goal is within himself. The basic need of the creator is independence. The reasoning mind cannot work under any form of compulsion. It cannot be curbed, sacrificed, or subordinated to any consideration whatsoever. It demands total independence in function and in motive. To a creator, all relations with men are secondary. A little later in the speech, he says, the man of independence 
is not concerned with others in any primary matter, not in his aim, not in his motive, not in his thinking, not in his desires, not in the source of his energy. He does not exist for any other man, and he asks no other man to exist for him. Howard Rourke understands what is a primary and what is a secondary consequence. You know, he, his, his work is the primary, and other things that come from that, money and fame and so on, are secondary consequences. He understood what the fundamental cause is, and, and um, he understands what's a fundamental cause versus what's an effect. Now, the contrast to this is Peter Keating, who basically, one way to understand the character of Peter Keating is to see that what he's doing, in effect, is trying to reverse cause and effect. Keating doesn't really care about the work of architecture. What he is interested in is, as a primary, is what Rourke regards as the secondary consequences. Keating wants fame. He wants fortune. He wants admiration. He wants to be regarded as a great architect. But, you know, the actual work, he doesn't want to be bothered with the actual work of getting his hands dirty, smudging on the table. That's a, you know, smudging away on the drafting table is sort of an unpleasant chore to be handed over to subordinates. So Keating, in effect, is trying to reverse cause and effect. He wants the secondary consequences without really having his primary passion and his motivation is not the work of architecture. He's interested in all these secondary things that come from other people. But Howard Rourke understands that in order to be a, an independent creator and in order to achieve real happiness in life, you have to be motivated by the work that you do, by your productive work. For Howard Rourke, it's the doing that really matters. It's doing the work. That's what really, that's what comes first. That's what's the primary. That's what's the cause. And that's what really matters to him. And he explains this to Peter Keating. Before you can do things for people, you must be the kind of man who can get things done. But to get things done, you must love the doing, not the secondary consequences. The work, not the people. Your own action not any possible object of your charity. I'll be glad if people who need it find a better manner of living in a house I designed. But that's not the motive of my work, nor my reason, nor my reward. Howard Rourke's reward is the joy that he finds in doing his work. And that joy is an end in itself. Ayn Rand stated the theme of the Fountainhead as individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in man's soul. We've spent a fair bit of time talking about the character of Howard Rourke, who's the embodiment of individualism in man's soul, that this morality of individualism or the a new concept of selfishness that she wanted to convey in the novel. Now we're going to turn to the other side of the theme, which is collectivism in man's soul. And the arch representative of collectivism, you know, not in politics, but in man's soul, is the character of Ellsworth Toohey. Throughout the novel, what Ellsworth Toohey preaches is altruism. He preaches unselfishness, selflessness, sacrifice for the sake of others. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at what he preaches and the way people typically understand the concept of altruism or selflessness. And by analyzing it and looking at the effects that it has on the people who try to live by it, we'll start to see that there's a deeper meaning that Ayn Rand is expressing here about the real nature of altruism, the real meaning of altruism. And through the character of Ellsworth Toohey, we'll get a glimpse into what altruism really means and what people who preach altruism and promote altruism are really after, as embodied by the character of Ellsworth Toohey. Now, we've looked at this a little bit. We looked at the character of Katie Halsey, Ellsworth Toohey's niece and Peter Keating's girlfriend. And she's somebody who, you know, takes, takes seriously the idea of trying to live an unselfish life. She's somebody who holds a conventional view of what, uh, what a conventional view of morality, of what constitutes virtue, what constitutes being a good person. And she interprets that the way most people do, as just as being... Um, trying to live unselfishly, trying to live for the sake of others. And 
we've seen that what this, uh, her view is that this is um, what it means to be good, this is what it means to be virtuous, and what she expects is that if she lives according to these principles, if she lives an unselfish life, this is what will bring her happiness and fulfillment in life. This is, she's always been taught that this is the good, this is, this is what it means to do the right thing, and she thinks that this is the path to fulfillment and happiness. But we see, over the course of the novel, we see that what ends up happening to her is that she's not happy. She's not fulfilled. She finds herself, she goes into, you know, through the influence of her uncle, she goes into social work, and over time, she, uh, trying hard to live an unselfish life, how she ends up is she ends up a, a sort of nasty, bitter, uh, spiteful social worker who, you know, has achieved no happiness. She's, she's renounced any sort of personal joy or values in her life and is completely miserable. So what we see is that for Katie, altruism, the, the, this moral ideal, trying to live by altruism as a moral ideal, has led to a certain contradiction in her life. She thought that this is the moral life, that this is the path to fulfillment and a happy life, and she finds exactly the opposite. So there's a certain contradiction between what she's always been told about morality and about you know, what's required to have a good life, versus what she experiences in her own life. The morality of altruism is, is full of all kinds of contradictions like this. You know, we're, we're so surrounded by the idea that altruism is, is the essence of virtue, that it's, it's sort of, it's, synonymous with morality itself. We do, if you think about being good, we immediately think of being unselfish, being altruistic. But, and, and we're so surrounded by the slogans of altruism that we barely think twice about them. We don't really stop to give them a lot of thought. But in, in Ayn Rand's view, if you, if you actually stop and think about what altruism is preaching, you, you start to see that in, in, in many ways, you know, there's a, there's a lot of unresolved questions, a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense here. Think about a slogan like, it's better to give than to receive. I mean, that is a standard commonplace slogan. It's hard to think of a slogan of altruism that's more commonplace than that. It's better to give than to receive. It's so commonplace that, you know, everybody says that kind of slogan and we take it for granted. We assume that it's just automatically true. We don't really think about what it means. But if you stop and ask yourself questions about something as simple as that, it's better to give than to receive, you start to open up all kinds of questions that reveal that it really doesn't make any sense. And in her novel Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand has one of her characters just asking a whole series of questions about this kind of slogan. And this is what the character says. Why is it moral to serve the happiness of others but not your own. If enjoyment is a value, why is it moral when experienced by others, but immoral when experienced by you? Why is it immoral for you to desire, but moral for others to do so? Why is it immoral to produce a value and keep it, but moral to give it away? And if it is not moral for you to keep a value, why is it moral for others to accept it? If you are selfless and virtuous when you give it, are they not selfish and vicious when they take it? Does virtue consist of serving vice? Is the moral purpose of those who are good self-immolation for the sake of those who are evil? So the point is that none of this makes any sense. As soon as you start to really question these slogans of altruism, you see that it, they raise all kinds of questions that, that just make them seem completely contradictory, like they just don't make any sense at all. Now, Howard Rourke makes a similar point, a related point, in his courtroom speech when he's talking about egoism versus altruism. Men have been taught that the highest virtue is not to achieve, but to give. Yet, one cannot give that which has not been created. Creation comes before distribution, or there will be nothing to distribute. The need of the creator comes before the need of any possible beneficiary. Yet, we are taught to admire the second-hander who dispenses gifts he has not produced, 
above the man who made the gifts possible. We praise an act of charity, we shrug at an act of achievement. Men have been taught that the ego is the synonym of evil and selflessness the ideal of virtue. But the creator is the egotist in the absolute sense, and the selfless man is the one who does not think, feel, judge, or act. These are functions of the self. What Rourke is pointing out here is that even on their own terms, altruists are caught in a contradiction. Even on the premise that the goal is to help the needy, the, what Rourke is pointing out is that the only way to help the needy is by not holding selflessness as an ideal. The, the only way to help people, the only way that you can, you can offer goods to help other people is if the goods are produced in the first place. And it's the, the selfish actions of the independent creator that creates the goods. So even on their own terms, um, altruism undermines its own professed goals in its attack on egoism, in its attack on, on self-interest. So all of this raises the question of what is, what is the real motive here? What is the real motive of the people who preach altruism? Is that the professed goal is to help the needy and to help others, but is that really what the goal is? If they're caught in a contradiction like this, it raises the question of is, are they, is their goal really to help the needy or is it primarily to oppose egoism? Is it really to lift up the helpless or is it to crush people who don't need any help, to, to crush the, the independent creator? Um, now, Ayn Rand has a definite answer to this question, and she shows her answer to this question through the character of Ellsworth Toohey. Ellsworth Toohey is the character in The Fountainhead who preaches altruism. He is the arch exponent of altruism and collectivism in the novel. And he preaches the morality of selflessness to everyone around him. This is his theme song. And, you know, it's through his influence that people in the novel act altruistically. He's the one who influences Katie Halsey through the course of her career, you know, through the course of her life to live in an unselfish way. It's through his guidance that she gives up the idea of going to college. It's through his influence that she becomes a social worker. It's through his influence that she ends up, you know, in this life of soulless misery. It's through his influence that Peter Keating and Katie Halsey never marry each other, which is the one value, the one authentic value that each of them really hold in life. And it's through Tui's influence that they never go after it and never achieve it. Ellsworth Toohey throughout the novel, you know, plots and schemes to encourage everyone around him to sacrifice their values, to renounce any personal self-interest that they might have in life. And he works throughout the novel to bring out the worst in every character he comes into contact with. He works to destroy and oppose any pursuit of personal values that they might have. And he himself lives according to the ideal of selflessness as well. You know, he is shown as not pursuing any important personal values. You know, he's given $100,000 as an inheritance, and he turns it over intact to a charity and keeps none of it for himself. You know, he publishes this book, Sermons in Stone, which is quite successful, and it's stated that he could command a much larger income than he does, but he chooses not to. So he himself, you know, lives according to the ideals that he preaches, and basically he sows a path of destruction all around him by means of these ideals that he preaches. So, you know, again, this raises the question of what is he really after? What is Ellsworth Toohey really after? And by implication, what are the proponents of altruism really after? Fortunately for us, Ellsworth Toohey tells us exactly what he's after. He tells us explicitly in great detail what his real motives are. He does this basically in a speech that he makes to Peter Keating. So during the whole Cortland Holmes affair, Ellsworth Toohey goes to Peter Keating to extract from him the confession that it was really Howard Rourke who designed the building. 
and he takes this opportunity to let Keating have it, to let him, to tell him explicitly what he's been after this whole time. And basically what he explains, what Ellsworth Toohey is after is power. Ellsworth Toohey wants to rule over men, and altruism is his means of acquiring power over men. This is what he explains. The real meaning of altruism for someone like Ellsworth Toohey is that it's a tool that he can use to get a hold on men's souls so that he can rule over them. You know, we remember at the age of 15, he talks about having the goal of collecting souls. Well, altruism is the weapon that he uses, the means that he uses to go about collecting souls. So how does this work? Well, Ellsworth Dewey understands that the need for self-interested action is sort of built into our very natures as living organisms. You know, every animal acts for its own self-preservation. So the basic idea is that if you can convince men that it's the height of virtue to renounce your self-interest, that the good and the moral life is a selfless life, you set a standard that's impossible for people to achieve. It's, it's inherent in our nature to pursue our self-interest. And what you accomplish is you make men feel guilty for acting in a manner that's consistent with their nature as a living being. You tell them that the height of virtue is selflessness, which is an ideal that they can never achieve, and you crush their self-esteem. And he explains this to Peter Keating in exactly this way. He says, preach selflessness. Tell man that he must live for others. Tell men that altruism is the ideal. Not a single one of them has ever achieved it, and not a single one ever will. His every living instinct screams against it. But don't you see what you accomplish? Man realizes that he's incapable of what he's accepted as the noblest virtue, and it gives him a sense of guilt, of sin, of his own basic unworthiness. Tui works to destroy values in men and any sense of reverence for greatness. Don't let anything remain sacred in a man's soul, and his soul won't be sacred to him. Kill reverence, and you've killed the hero in man. Tui basically lists off all the ways that altruism can be used to get a hook into men's souls. He describes the most important method as follows. Don't allow men to be happy. Happiness is self-contained and self-sufficient. Happy men have no time and no use for you. Happy men are free men. So kill their joy in living. Make them feel that the mere fact of a personal desire is evil. Bring them to a state where saying, I want, is no longer a natural right, but a shameful admission. Altruism is of great help in this. So, Tui uses altruism as a tool for getting people to renounce their personal desires, renounce their personal values. Altruism is a tool for killing every per each person's individual spirit. And once they've renounced their basic self, once, once they've renounced their, their individuality and their independence, they're left with no will to resist the rule of a leader who's going to come and tell them what's right and tell them what to do. And that is what Ellsworth Toohey wants to be. He wants to be, he wants to rule over men. He wants to use altruism as a tool for getting men to renounce their self, their very selves, so that he can rule over them. Now, Gail Wynand is a character who's portrayed as also seeking power over men. But Ellsworth Toohey's quest for power is different from Wynand's. And it's different because Tui understands men better than Gail Wynand does. Basically, Wynand tries to seek power over men by bending them to his will and sort of making them do his bidding. You know, he tries to break men of integrity by pitting his strength and his will against theirs. Ellsworth Tui takes a much more insidious approach. He tries to set men's integrity against itself. Now, basically what he does is he preaches an ideal and that, that is inherently self-destructive. And so men of integrity who try to live up to that ideal end up acting in a self-destructive way in the name of integrity to that ideal. So, you know, where Wynand tries to fight men's integrity, 
Tui uses it as a weapon for people to end up destroying themselves. He sets men's integrity against themselves. And this is much more effective because he's using people's respect for morality and their desire to be good, but he's twisting it and he's using it as a way of making them destroy themselves. So this is Ayn Rand's uh, view of altruism. As, as Howard Rourke puts it in, in the novel, altruism is a weapon of exploitation. Now, most people who preach altruism, you know, most people who regard it as a noble philosophy and who preach it as an ideal, you know, for the most part, they're not like Ellsworth Toohey in the sense that they're not consciously using altruism as a tool for destroying people or for achieving power over them. But whether people consciously are aware of it or not, the effect of upholding altruism as a moral ideal is this self-destruction, is this destructive effect that it has on people's lives. Now, Ellsworth Toohey is portrayed as being someone who understands this consciously and embraces it anyway. So he's, he's portrayed in this respect as the, as the epitome of evil. Now, he, he's self-conscious enough about his own goals that he even, you know, almost warns Peter Keating and, and tells him what, what people's attitude toward altruism should be if they value their own lives. He says, Just listen to any prophet, and if you hear him speak of sacrifice, run. Run faster than from a plague. It stands to reason that where there's sacrifice, there's someone collecting sacrificial offerings. Where there's service, there's someone being served. The man who speaks to you of sacrifice speaks of slaves and masters and intends to be the master. But if ever you hear a man telling you that you must be happy, that it's your natural right, that your first duty is to yourself, that will be the man who is not after your soul. And in The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand portrays a man who says exactly those last things, a man who's not after anyone's soul, and that man is Howard Rourke.